Library for the best of PBS. Could you talk about the fact that we killed a man? Why would we want to do that? I don't want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to the science. Muhammad Ali was the most important man in the world. The price of freedom comes high. I have paid, but I am free. These and other shows from your PBS station are available with Passport on the PBS Video app. Download it today. You're watching New England Public Media on WGBY Springfield. She wanted to help build a new Germany. Letting go of the old is part of the new beginning. She had the capacity to solve problems. Freedom is never something that can be taken for granted. Watch In Their Own Words December 28th or stream at nepm.org. Coming up, stories we're connecting you with tonight. We'll introduce you to some artisans on display during the recent Crafts of Coleraine Studio Tour. I never feel like I'm going to work. And every piece of wood has a story, and I just love uncovering that story. Connecting music and special education to unlock the learning potential of differently abled students. Language breakthroughs, young people who, with autism who are not speaking, but could sing. It just makes us all, just gives us yep. so much hope. And we'll take a hike up one of Western Massachusetts' most beautiful mountains. The views on the top are fascinating. You can see great views of the Berkshires, including Mount Greylock, Mount Everett to the south, part of the Taconics, which are along the New York State border. We'll bring you those stories and more as we explore the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England, up next on Connecting Point. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Good evening, and thanks for joining us for Connecting Point. I'm Saidalis Bauer. Over the weekends of November 13th and 14th, the Franklin County town of Coleraine, Massachusetts, hosted its 18th annual Crafts of Coleraine self-guided tour. The event featured 19 different artists and artisans who opened the doors to their workshops, and visitors were able to follow a map of the town to stop into each one for a behind-the-scenes look at their operations. Connecting Point's Brian Sullivan met up with two of those artisans ahead of the tour and brings us the story. The quiet hill town of Coleraine, Massachusetts rests on the southern border of Vermont and has a population of roughly 1,700. But this Franklin County bedroom community wasn't always so sleepy, back when agriculture employed a majority of its residents, and those not working in the farm trades were likely employed by the local mills. Now, with those days in the rear view for over half a century, the town has undergone not only a major economic change, but also one of identity. There's a lot of people that moved to the hill towns in the 60s, you know, kind of back to the land movement, the hippie movement, several other different things, and they kind of stayed and had kids and grandkids, and they're part of the land now, and, and they've brought a renaissance to the arts. It's the kind of town where a former electrician and pastor like Neil Stetson can turn his passion for woodworking into his post-retirement career. And for Sarah Shadle, who spent her career in education, well, she can finally tap into her artistic side now. And the community has taken notice. For the better part of the past two decades, the town has hosted a unique event known as the Crafts of Coleraine Studio Tour. Unlike art shows and farmers markets that tend to be centralized to one location, the Crafts of Coleraine is a self-guided tour of several artisan studios and workshops scattered throughout the town of Coleraine. One of them is right here in Neil Stetson's garage. And for anyone with an affinity for the sound and smell of the high school wood shop, this garage is a little slice of heaven. A quick glance around the room and one may get the impression that Stetson has been up to this for most of his adult life. But it's really something he just started only a few years ago, following a 35-year career as a pastor. I've always wanted to do this, so I started shopping on Craigslist and Marketplace and all those places for tools and I had a fairly good set of tools, my own mostly hand tools, and uh, just started making things and 
somebody said, hey, you should take this to a farmer's market. So we did, and then they said, hey, you know, this is better than farmer's market material. You need to start going to juried art shows. Those juried art shows helped create the demand for items like these shaker boxes and cutting boards, among other things. This opened the door for Stetson to then enter the Coleraine show a couple of years ago. Meanwhile, on the other side of town is someone who is no stranger to the crafts tour, having taken part in each of the past ten. First-time tourgoers will likely enjoy traveling along the scenic byway of Route 112 that cuts through the center of town to get there. The beautiful hillside property of artist Sarah Shadle shouldn't disappoint either. In fact, it was the inspiration for the name of her company. My son-in-law had had uh, named our place here the compound because we kept adding on over the years, 36 years that we've been here. We built our house, then added on the studio. and. I not only do baskets, but I paint and do jewelry, and so I feel like, well, that's a good name, Compound Creations. The baskets tend to be the big draw, and while I was able to see those that were on display, watching them be created was something I'd have to wait until the warmer months to witness. My basket studio is uh, above my garage, and it's not heated, so I um, am not actively making baskets at this time of year. I have to work in the uh, spring and summer, just in the mornings before it gets too hot. And, um, but the, I try to set up my home and my studio uh, display for people to come in and see what I do and can make a purchase if they're, they happen to be in the shopping mood. Watching artists and artisans like Shadle and Stetson, who seem to be doing something they've waited their whole lives to do, may serve as an inspiration for those of us still navigating through our first acts, that there is a chance for a second act. I never feel like I'm going to work. I always feel like I get to uncover what God created today, you know. And every piece of wood has a story, and I just love uncovering that story. Every Friday night, Connecting Point explores the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England, but it doesn't stop there. You can find us online anytime for exclusive features and content. Susan B. Anthony was arrested in Rochester this week on November 18th in 1872 for leading women to vote. Born in the northern Berkshire County town of Adams, Massachusetts, Anthony was a social reformer and women's rights activist who played a pivotal role in the women's suffrage movement. And Connecting Point paid a visit to Adams to learn more about her life and legacy in this week's digital exclusive. In the 1840s, she went to a temperance convention and she tried to get up on stage and address the assembly and a gentleman stopped her and said, no, the ladies have come to listen, not to speak. And that was one of those moments when she started turning her attention to women's rights. Don't miss this digital exclusive available online right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. The Community Music School of Springfield recently received a state budget allocation of $50,000 for their adaptive music program, a partnership with the Springfield Public Schools. The program, which serves over 500 students in 14 schools, connects music and special education to enhance and unlock the learning potential for differently abled students, as well as offer professional development training for educators. I spoke with Eileen McCaffrey, the Executive Director of the Community Music School of Springfield, as well as Mary Kay Brown, Director of Partnerships at John J. Duggan Academy in Springfield, to hear how these funds will make an impact in the program. About nine years ago, we embarked on a project called the Sonino Musica Program, which was a partnership that was uh, developed directly with the Springfield Public Schools and the Community Music School to support music education. We are happy to say that we have uh, strings programs and band programs that support the amazing work happening in the Springfield Public Schools, and now we've expanded it to Holyoke. In that regard, after working in these partnerships, what we realized was that the uh, special ed students who were participating in our programs were really benefiting from this beautiful art form. And so we decided to do a deeper dive. And fortunately, we had in our fa among our faculty, uh, not just music specialists, but also special ed uh, folks. And so we developed a capacity and we went to a couple of our partner programs, such as Duggan Academy 
and Mary Kay Brown and asked if we could pioneer this new project called the Adaptive Music Program. We're now in 14 schools in both Springfield and Holyoke. And it's just been an amazing journey um, of really taking our amazing special ed students and giving them an opportunity to have a music program tailored, tailored specifically to their needs. What was so wonderful about it is how collaborative it was. Um, the music teachers in the district may not necessarily have the specific skills that the AMP music program um, provides. So the music teacher in the schools together with the paraprofessionals and the teachers all come together as a unit to help support the instruction for our, our young people. And to see their eyes light up when the instructor comes into the classroom, they know what to expect. They know they're going to be singing. They know they're going to be playing instruments. They know they're going to be singing about the curriculum because the instructor will figure out what it is that they're doing curricularly in the classroom and turn it into a song that they can then sing through the day when the instructor has moved on to another classroom. And also how going remote, we didn't miss a beat. Mm -hmm. To beat. And what was beautiful about it was not only did you have the student in front of you, but you had the whole family because the parents were there sitting side by side with their children to make sure they were accessing the Zoom, accessing the curriculum. And now they got to sing along with Andy. Let's talk about that a little bit, because I remember when all the students had to go remote in all these districts, I really was thinking about all the students in special education not receiving that hands-on time that they had with instructors and programs. How did you all manage to stay engaged with these special education students through this program? We're fortunate to be part of a national network, and we, as we talk to folks across the country, um, we had a pretty unusual experience that we were able to, as Mary Kay said, not miss a beat. What we didn't realize was that across the country, most of the partnership programs were not able to continue, and that had significant consequences. I think it is because of the depth of the partnership. I think it's because we love our kids collectively. We all love our kids so much and knew, as you mentioned, how essential it was for us to find ways to connect. And also just the beautiful power of music. That there's something, you know, they did studies that while people were home, they actually engaged in um, the arts, all of our families in their own sort of non-structured way. But we all found, I don't know if you, your family found that, but you know, when you were home, you really got clear on what, the essential ingredients of joy looked like even while we were all locked down. Absolutely. And so speaking to that and that joy of music, and I witnessed the magic in that joy when I visited Community Music School in Springfield several years ago for Sonido Musica. So it's just so nice to hear that you all are receiving this funding. With this funding, what, what impact will that make on this program? So what we've used the money for and what we will continue to use the money for is not only the classroom work that we talked about that Mary Kay is, is referring to, but we found that creating professional development opportunities, that, that question you asked about pivoting remotely, that was uh, part of what we were able to use our funding for was to have a really nice, have beautiful camera work provided by Focus Springfield and um, some of the folks from Legacy Sounds. But we're really trying to use the money to increase our own skill building. Um, also, uh, frankly, we're doing a lot of important work around um, creating um, an equity framework for culturally and historically responsive um, pedagogy, as well as, frankly, just paying our teaching artists to be able to go and do more sites and provide more services on the ground. Now, Mary Kay, you are on the inside of all this magic happening in this program. Talk to me about what um, what a class looks like in, in the adaptive music program and what have been some of your favorite moments and experiences that you have witnessed or teachers have shared with you? I asked the teachers to provide me with some testimonials and they, they jumped on it because they feel that the AMP music program really supports what they're doing in the classroom. I'm just going to read a little bit from one of the testimonials because I want to make sure I, I, I capture it. Our adaptive music teacher 
brings with her engaging activities that incorporate movement, rhythm, being conscious of our body and space, which complements elements of teaching that go on in the classroom, such as math, counting beats, recognizing patterns in music, or social skills, being aware of our body in space as we move through the room. These are all skills that our um, special ed teachers, specifically the autistic um, classroom teachers, work on with the students every single day. And this is what um, AMP brings to the classroom. And there are lots of students who are very, very musical. And the adaptive music teacher will pick those students and help them to sort of lead the classroom in song and activities because they know that those particular students really have a real, real love and interest in music. As you mentioned, Eileen, um, you serve over 500 students in 14 different schools, which is amazing. What are the hopes for the future of this program? This is a program that has really um, the scale of it could be, you know, replicated much more broadly. Um, we're fortunate we use the funding from the STARS grants from the Mass Cultural Council to support this. But honestly, with additional funding, we could offer this far more broadly into the schools. And some of the most incredible breakthroughs have come, language breakthroughs, young people who, with autism who were not speaking, but could sing, you know, yes. words were coming. It's, it just makes us all, just gives us... Yep so much hope and our hope is that we continue to do the work that the work becomes even deeper and more embedded in these beautiful partnerships with our schools like Mary Kay and that we continue to get the type of funding support that allows us to do this work um, again and again and again and to be a national model so that other states look and say boy what's happening here in Springfield we could do this as well and, and if we can make it accessible in terms of how we're doing this, that would also be a great hope and joy for us, is to see this flourishing across the country, not just in our own community. This past Wednesday was National Take a Hike Day, and Monument Mountain is a well-known and popular hiking spot in Great Barrington. So popular, in fact, that USA Today named the mountain to its list of 50 most beautiful sites in the U.S. Literary giants like Herman Melville and Nathaniel Hawthorne drew inspiration from the views. At the 1,600-foot peak and an estimated 20,000 hikers make the climb to the top each year to enjoy the scenery. Connecting Points Dave Frazier visited the mountain to explore its history and beauty. I've been hiking it so long, I don't remember, probably the first time was 20 years ago, I don't remember how I actually got started with it, but it's a, it's a wonderful mountain. The views on the top are fascinating. You can see great views of the Berkshires, including Mount Greylock, Mount Everett to the south in the southern Berkshires. I think you can see part of the Taconics, which are along the New York State border, and on a clear day you can see the Catskills. Monument Mountain is part of the Trustees of Reservations, which is a statewide organization. Uh, Monument is actually one of our oldest reservations, given to us in 1899 by Charles Butler. So it's really important to us and has quite a significance here in the region. Uh, first as a sacred site for the Stockbridge Mohican tribe, and then as a place of literary importance because it's where Herman Melville and Nathaniel Hawthorne met for a very famous picnic in 1850 uh, and where the idea for Moby Dick came from. USA Today just named Monument Mountain the most beautiful place in Massachusetts. I, I can see why they made that choice, and I think most people who do the hike and visit the mountain also can see you know, why it is designated as one of Massachusetts' most beautiful sites. I think we're, we're lucky. I think I take it for granted that, that we live in an area where there's so much hiking. It's a challenge to get to the top, awesome views, and it's close by my hometown. I don't think you can ever not appreciate it once you come up here because it is so nice and you, just, you appreciate even more that you have access to it. The peak is at 1,642 feet. Uh, that's about a 700-foot 
climb uh, from the parking lot where you enter the trail. Uh, it's about 500 acres and there's roughly three and a half miles of trail there. It's fun to work in the shadow of Monument Mountain. I feel very fortunate to be doing what I do for the trustees, uh, to have such inspiring places, you know, to keep our work going and inspiring new members uh, and future stewards of the many properties that we manage across the states. Since early childhood, Joy Layden felt a disconnect between her body and soul, but the one thing she did feel a connection to was poetry. In 2007, Layden went through the transition to living her female gender identification and became the first and only openly transgender employee of an Orthodox Jewish organization. Now, as a published essayist and poet of several books, Layden is also a nationally recognized speaker on trans and Jewish identity. I spoke with Layden to hear more about her work and her journey through identity and transition. I started writing poetry in a home that was completely not literary. We didn't have poetry books. But as soon as I started writing, I started writing what I consider poems, what I would now call like rhymes. But I not only considered them poems, I considered them great poems, even though I had no concept of literature. And I've often like, what was it about? What did I think I was doing when I was six years old that I thought was so important? And I think that it was because when I wrote, I felt connected to language as a whole, something larger than myself. When I made words rhyme, I was showing that words that seemed to be different on the outside had an inner kinship on the inside. And I wonder if that's not the way I felt about my female gender identification, that I could feel it rhyming with other girls, but they couldn't see that. The second book, book that you published entitled The Book of Anna, it's a collection of prose diary entries and poems in the voice of a concentration camp survivor and was the last book that you published as a man. The second edition was recently published this spring. How pivotal was this book for you through your journey of identity and transition? When I started writing it, I thought, you know, this is this is really great because it's a way of I'm willing to do this work because of this trans thing. And it will help me keep things in balance while living as a man. What I didn't realize was that as uh, the, the character in the book, Anna, was uh, emerging to me, um, she was teaching me that I was basically wrong in everything that I thought uh, being a woman was. I mean, she just didn't fit any of the preconceptions that I had. She was, you know, she's angry. She's tough as nails. She does not, she's not nice. You know, I was always trying to be very nice. And I confused being nice with being good. Um, and I confused going along and accommodating people with being honest. If you're what people want, then that's like, you know, somehow that seemed to be okay. And I confused all of that with being female. So she wasn't a woman, according to any of my, you know, underdeveloped ideas of it. She was really herself. And it wasn't until years later, when I, after years of living as myself, that I thought, oh, right, I, gender transition isn't becoming all women. Nobody can become a generic category. There are no women who are all women. Everybody is who you are individually. And that's what it's about for me. And that's what Anna, in an extreme way, she still scares me, was modeling for me. You've been recognized as LGBTQ Nation's top 50 transgender Americans and you've delivered talks nationally on trans and Jewish identity. What motivates you to do this type of work? Being a teacher to me involves two things that are sacred and they're linked together. It's trying to help other people to understand, but in order to do that, I need to understand. Like I can't help other people understand unless I'm always engaged in the work of understanding other people. 
I have to keep growing and learning that way. And so teaching is a way that we grow together in understanding. And so I pay attention to anti-trans feminists and uh, evangelical critiques of trans identity, not because it's fun to read that stuff, but because it's my job to understand so that I can help others understand. And to that point, what is something that you would like people to understand about the trans community? Being trans and non-binary is just another, these are just different ways of being human. And not only that, but identities for all of us. It's like what Anna was trying to teach me. None of these identities, no matter how well they work for us, and sometimes they work really well for us, you know, we get a lot of goodies from them but none of the identities that any culture gives us perfectly fit us as individuals or perfectly fit us all our lives. So all of us in a way are, Emerson said this, Ralph Waldo Emerson, he said, we pass for what we are. All of us are passing for what we are. We're saying, I want people to understand me and so I'll present myself as a category they understand rather than the full messy me that I'm not sure they'll understand. But basically, I think that trans and non-binary people give everybody a chance to embrace the larger parts of themselves that don't fit into the categories and roles they've been given. That does it for Connecting Point for November 19th, 2021. Remember, you can always find the stories that you saw tonight, as well as exclusive features, digital-only content, and more online anytime at nepm.org slash connecting point. And please be sure to join us again next Friday night at 6, right here on New England Public Media, for more stories of the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. I'm Saidalis Bauer. Thanks for watching, and have a great weekend. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. thought they were sending their children off to die. They stripped them of culture. They just became a number. The white man wanted you to learn his way. I want everybody to know what happened to our children in those